Welcome to the Brain Pick a Pro Show live from Lake Wiley, South Carolina. I'm Larry Goins. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really, really appreciate it. We got a lot of loyal followers that watch us, uh, watch the new podcast every week. And what we try to do on this show, we have another show called Brag, Be Rich and Generous. But what we try to do on this show is to bring you specific guests that are movers and shakers that are not only doing a lot of deals, but also are living, living the kind of life that, that they want to live and, and that they dream of living, right? And it's not just about how many houses you can flip. It's about so much more than that. And, and I say that because our special guest today, uh, Damian Lupo, I'm really, really excited to have him on. He's not only a black belt in martial arts, but he's also a black belt in real estate as well. I mean, he's, he bought his first house with a visa, right? Uh, but, but he's just, he, he's, he's owned multi-million dollars worth of properties and he, he's been, ha, had ups, had downs and he's gone through it all. Right. And now what he does is help fellow entrepreneurs, uh, and small business, business owners to be able to, to live the kind of life that they want to live. So please give a warm welcome to Damien. What's going on? Hey Larry, it's good to see you, man. <laughs> Hey, how you been? Been good. Been really good. I was I was thinking about what it's the when you think about a black belt and you think about buying a visa on your credit card, that's like going into fight Floyd Mayweather with a blindfold on. Like that is <laughs> one of the dumbest things you that I and I did it, you know, but that would have been the equivalent right. before I became a black belt in anything, I was doing things that were pretty damn crazy and stupid. Wow. That's amazing. That's amazing. So t tell us a little bit about uh, a little bit about yourself. Uh, well, you know, what? I, I, here, here's the thing. I, I'm, I went conventional to unconventional to disruptive. And I, I basically, when I was growing up in Alaska, I, I did things because I was trying to solve a problem. Like my parents told me we were broke and I didn't like that idea. That seemed really stupid to me. Right. And, and so I went out and started a business buying and selling Nintendo games and that was how I started making money. I lost all my money. I've actually not really told the story, but my 18th birthday, I opened up a brokerage account and put all the money I'd saved up for my businesses and working, mowing lawns, and then lost that within the first year speculating. And that was one of the, one of the lessons that I didn't really, I didn't remember because I did the same thing in real estate years later, speculating. And when, when I really got it was when I made, when I started investing, went to seminars and learned how to become a bank where you basically you're buying property and then you're, you're lease optioning it. And that's what I did a whole bunch of times after I got thrown out of college a couple of times and realized I was not meant for the conventional path. I went and, and started doing something where I was collecting assets and I busted my butt doing that for about five years and built up 150 house portfolio. So it worked because I worked my ass off. I mean, that's really what, what happened. So you built up 150 house portfolio. Tell us about that. How, how did you do that? How did you even I mean, 150 houses is a lot of houses, right? And, and I know, I mean, we, we've got like, I don't know, 20 or 30, 20 some or 30 houses under contract right now in our pipeline. But 150 houses, I mean, that, that's a lot to, to have in a portfolio. How did you do that? Well, I mean, maybe I should, we should start with why I did that because I thought okay. that more, you know, more was better. And that's what a lot of times I think people believe that if they get, 10 houses, then 20 houses is better and 30 is better than that. And it may or may not be true, but there's always a price you're going to pay. And the reality is with houses, each one of those is kind of its own little business. So I had 150 little businesses in seven different states. Is that a good idea? Not when each of those houses or businesses is paying 100 or 200 bucks a month. I mean, that's a crazy amount of work for, for that. So in, in reflection, one of the things that I wrote about in my very first book, which if you want to see the worst looking book that's ever been published, it's called Maverick Mistakes in Real Estate Investing. Uh -huh. It's a PowerPoint. That's what the front cover was designed on with comics on. <laughs> one of the chapters in there was about the five-star investing approach. And when I started, I invested all over the place. In Phoenix, I had stuff. I had, I had houses that were 100 miles apart. And that just meant that I would spend an entire day showing somebody a house or going and fixing a house. And so I, I basically had no idea about how valuable my time was at that point. Right. So I just hustled to compensate for my stupidity and naivety and building up the 150 houses was a, it was really a reflection of doing mostly the same thing over and over and over again, which I think is really hard for people because they get bored. 
and they want to go do the sexy thing and they jump from one thing to the next and they always get in the back of the line and start over. You know, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, based on what you were saying, you know, 150 little businesses, a hundred to $200 a month cash flow, each one, you, you must've been, you know, using private money or going to the bank or something like that. Well, in the beginning, I didn't have any money. I had no, I had no track record or anything. So, right. um, but the idea was I did creative stuff. I, the first thing I did with it was my visa card. And then I negotiated, I solved problems. And this is like the hack that Tim Ferriss doesn't talk about. Go solve a seller's problem and you can create unbelievable wealth. So I went in and took over mortgages and that's how I was able to buy the first 20, 30 houses. Right. I didn't have any money and I didn't have the credit and I didn't have a job to qualify. So I solved problems. People needed to leave. They really didn't have much, if any equity. And I was able to step in and take over that problem. And so th doing that 20, 30, 40 times gave me the track record. I earned the track record. And so at that point, I could go out there and I could work with investors. And I had investors that would sign on loans so, so I could pick the houses. Because when you're doing the creative financing, you, you basically are dealing with whatever houses show up. You don't get to go pick them and say, hey, sure. I want to do this financing. People don't right. like that so much usually. Right. You're buying the terms, not the specific house. That's, that's what it was. And, and there, it's, it's usually a very cool idea until you do something stupid. Like you say, the terms are the only thing that matters. And that's not true. I bought houses where I bought them at 100% of, of their value. And I got great terms because they were VA loans. And then I had a crap house and nobody wanted to buy it. So ultimately, because of HOAs that I bought some condos like this, I was getting eaten alive with the monthly. So I was losing two or three or 400 a month. And when I said this is not going to work cash flow wise and went to sell it, I ended up losing $10,000 because I was over leveraged. So the terms, even if you have a low interest rate, doesn't necessarily mean it's a good deal. You have to be really smart about that. And I was just thinking, oh, terms are the only thing that matter because some guru told me that. And so I bought into it. Wow. Wow. That's amazing. And, and it seems like to me, the more I invest, the more I learn and, and the deeper I find out. You know, I mean, I've been doing this over 30 years and, and there's always somebody that knows something or has a technique that I've never heard of before, right? I mean, things are always changing and you've got to be, uh, be growing and you've also got to be looking at, you know, uh, I don't want to do this anymore. Or I don't like to do this anymore, you know, so you don't, there comes a time you want to be able to sit back and get passive income and not really just grind out on how many houses I can have, right? Yeah, not everybody wants to be Grant Cardone. I mean, I like Grant's books and I've been around Grant and everything, right. but the idea of grinding and hustling indefinitely forever. I mean, Grant's around 60 years old and he won't stop, I don't think, until he's dead at the yeah, level he's it. playing. So, I mean, the question is, do you want to do that? I don't think that I, quitting or retiring is necessarily a great idea because I think we just shrivel up and mostly die when that happens. But there is a question about whether or not you need to be at the edge of everything all the time. I think it's very, very dangerous health-wise. And the truth is, if you find somebody that's doing something well and you model it, you're probably going to be able to get very similar results if you actually do it. A lot of people go, oh, you know what? I got a better way. And right. so I see this at seminars all the time. And I look at people and I say, you haven't done it yet. The person that's teaching literally has done this and is making hundreds of thousands a year doing this. And you're telling them you got a better way your ego is getting in the way of your success. Right. That's the problem. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Now you mentioned retirement. I know you, I know you really hate the word retirement, you know, and, and, uh, and I want to, I want to hear what your version is of retirement anyway. It's a death sentence. I mean, it's, it's truly you saying, all right, I'm done. Cause I mean, the retirement was, it's really kind of a goofy industrial age agricultural idea when, when a piece of machinery or a farm animal was old and you know, tired, you basically took it out in the backyard and shot it, or you buried the piece of equipment. It was retired. It was done. Wow. And then in the wow. industrial age, all of a sudden, people were done because, well, why were they done? Because they were, it was basically a muscular event. And, and society said, oh, you know what? This person is getting older. They don't have the ability to maintain their energy or their strength. So let's just kind of push them out the door and find more young, youthful the problem is when you're 50, 60 years old, this is where all the wisdom is. This is the decades of experience that are so valuable. It's not being 20 years old with a six pack and giant biceps that matters anymore. Right. It's about the actual intelligence, emotionally, spiritually, beyond physically. That is a very old idea. So if you say, I'm retired, I'm done, I'm not contributing anymore, the likelihood and statistically 
the facts back this up, the numbers back it up, you're likely to be dead within a few years. That's what's going to happen. So should you retire? No, never. I mean, literally always be contributing in, for something that matters. And if you don't have that, you better find it because you're, you're going to be watching yourself go to your, uh, your uh, funeral here pretty, pretty soon if you don't find that thing. Exactly. Even if you don't need the money or need to work a job or, or be in your business anymore, if you just retire, like you said, that's, you know, going out to pasture, right? To be yeah, there, this idea of, and yeah, and the, the problem is people are working for money at something that they hate doing because they go, oh, I couldn't do the thing I love doing because it doesn't pay enough. Well, so basically you're trading, your, your, you're basically being a hooker. And I mean, most of us wouldn't like to have somebody call us a prostitute, but that's, that's kind of what we're doing. And, and the reality is if you're in love with what you're doing and it's, it, the side effect is money, you're going to be in a place where you're not going to want to let go of it. The reason that we want to retire is because we don't like what we do. My dad was like that. I remember as a kid, he said, I've only got 12 years left. And I thought, 12 out of 20 years, you've got 12 years left. He hated his job. Why would you do that to yourself and to everybody around you? Because you're miserable. The best of you is never going to show up in that space ever. It's, it's a horrible experience. So the advice I give is stop doing it. Get you know, pull the plug, blank slate your life, start fresh with something that actually matters that you care about. That is awesome. That is awesome. And I know uh, you like to talk about wealth too, you know, different differentiating wealth from like a big paycheck or a big bank account. I mean, you know, what kind of toll does that take on your family? I mean, you know, when you, when you think about wealth and a paycheck, wealth is freedom. It's, it's freedom to choose. And a big paycheck doesn't mean crap. I, I see people all the time come to me and they go, I, I need help with my money. And I say, great, tell me about it. And it, what most people listening would find fascinating is that they're trying to make more money where I have people coming to me that make a million to a year, have four, five, six million in the bank, and they're scared to death. And they're trying to figure out they're literally, they're, the problem they think they have is not the problem that is true, but for them and their minds, they think they need more money and that's going to solve the problem. So it's never enough. And so big paychecks, big paydays, when I was making a quarter million bucks a week selling houses, like when I was selling off assets, that was pretty good. I mean, most people would yeah. say that's like a lottery ticket. Right, and right. It's never enough because when I had one Ferrari, then I needed two and I, I, there, was no real, there was no real satisfaction or fulfillment. It was just more money. So it, that's not the solution. That big payday, it's just made up anyway. The question is, what, what, do you have the wealth? Do you have the freedom to actually do the things that matter? Are you contributing to anything that matters? And if right. you don't know what that means, you're probably on the wrong track. Right. And, and what kind of message are a lot of people sending their kids? That it's never enough and just keep hammering it. That, and we, we teach kids. So the messages we're sending are just work really hard in something that you don't necessarily love because yeah. you have to play safe and don't make mistakes. Because if you make mistakes, you're going to be kicked out of school. You're going to be kicked out of your job. We're teaching the opposite of reality. The people, right. whether it's in sports or business, the people that actually are the best and, and the most impactful, they're, they're falling down all the time, making tons of mistakes. They're doing something with purpose. And, and typically, there's passion. But having a passion project isn't the same as purpose. I mean, truly, purpose is what you're supposed to be doing. Passion may be something that's fun that has nothing to do with your purpose. So we have to be really careful about whether we're saying, oh, I'm on, I'm on the right path because I'm passionate about it. Yeah. You know what? You may just be enthusiastically running in the wrong direction too. <laughs> that's true. That's true. That's true. So how would you describe uh, that as it relates to financial freedom? Because a lot of people think having X amount of dollars in the bank or X amount of passive income is financial freedom. I, and I would, I would say that that's, that's a lie because if, if I were to hand anybody listening right now, $10 million in cash, are, they, are you going to be free? I mean, ask the person, ask the last 25 lottery winners if they feel free today. They're all broke. They're all bankrupt. Right. So being handed 10 million bucks, or let's say I handed you an apartment complex, 100 units, and it produced 10,000 bucks a month. Are you free? I would say no, because you have no idea how to recreate that. And the, the problem is, if you don't build the confidence muscle, you don't have the freedom because you can't recreate. And so you're always nervous that you're going to lose. So you end up playing not to lose versus playing to win. Confidence allows you to play to win. You don't see superstars in sports ever playing not to lose. They're playing to win. That's the only thing they know how to do because they've got the confidence in themselves. Yeah, and I think that's one of the reasons it's very, very important to keep score. I mean, if there's no scoreboard, you know, people don't play as hard. Wouldn't you agree? 
Yeah. The, I mean, the scoreboard, otherwise you, you literally think, oh, everything is good. I had an old business partner that used to say, when I would ask her how things are going and she would say, oh, I'm making progress. And again, I think she was running enthusiastically in the wrong direction. I go, you're making, you're like on a merry-go-round. You're just speeding it up and you feel like, hey, look, it's a new, it's a new thing, a new thing. I'm like, you're a guppy. It's the same thing over and over. You're just speeding it up. You keep kicking the ground. You're moving faster and faster. But where are you really going? Nowhere, faster. So I, I think people need to really challenge themselves. And oftentimes this requires somebody else. Remember that wisdom thing about 50, 60 years old? People that have gone through things, people that understand, and they're not just reading a book and regurgitating it. Right. Those are the people that can give you perspective. And so you can actually really ask yourself and then get the right answers. Am I making progress or am I just being delusional? Yeah, that's true. That's a really good point. I really like that. Um, a lot of people, especially business owners, whether they're real estate investors or own a small business or whatever, uh, they want to, they want to take control of their own finances and, and that sort of thing. So why isn't it enough for a good business, uh, enough to do good business uh, or do good in business and then have a financial advisor take care of the investing. That, that's like saying, you know what, I'm going to work out really, really, I'm going to work out a lot. I'm going to eat well. And, and now I've got a great body. So my spouse or my partner can really enjoy it. And I'm going to go in and have some passive sex. Like that's about the same thing. Why would you do that? Right, right. I mean, like literally it's it passively checking out. You're going to end up with results where your advisor is going to get rich and you're going to end up old. Right. It's, you can't say this is your whole plan. I'm not opposed to people having advisors. I think having a team is critical, but just handing your money over to somebody and, and then saying, okay, in, in 10 or 20 years, I hope it all works out. Great. So you're going to smoke a bunch of hopium and then it's going to be good. Like this is one of the dumber approaches that we've been tricked into by Wall Street and the financial industry that we're too stupid to manage our stuff, that it takes too much time. No, it doesn't, but it does take some time. And it's just a question of whether you're committed. And I don't think most people, everybody's looking for that hack, you know, the shortcut. Well, there is no hack. It's the same thing with, I bring up your sex life because there's no hack to it. Either you're there or not. Right, like you've right, got to right. be in, right? So it's the same thing with your money. You can do well in business, but if you hand your money over, I have a really good friend that did that, invested in real estate for 10 years, then he retired. And as we said, retirement's a dangerous thing. He took right. his money, handed it over to an advisor that was paying him 3%. I said, that's awesome. I said, 3% a month is good. He said, no, 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 that's a year. And I said, are you insane? You used to make no less than 20% on your money with your real estate consistently. He goes, yeah, but I just don't want to, I couldn't be bothered. And I thought, wow, you've literally decided to be poor and in poverty and, and focus on scarcity the rest of your life. That's embarrassing. Wow. Wow. It is really scary. I mean, it's sad. It's sad that somebody would do that. You got to be active and there is no shortcut in my opinion. I, I always say, People ask me about shortcuts to real estate, shortcuts to real estate success. What I tell people is the greatest shortcut to real estate is the day you realize there isn't one, <laughs> right? Yeah, that's the same. The people come up with the question, how long does it take to get a black belt? And I say 15 minutes. Just like how long does it take to get real estate? You know what? 15 minutes. Go buy a house. Does it mean it's, do you, do you actually own anything of value? Like, no, but it, you can have a black belt. You get one on Amazon, takes you three seconds on you know, one click. <laughs> but you want to become a black belt, it's the same thing as becoming wealthy and free in real estate. It's going to take five to 10 years. And that's the same thing with, I mean, you're basically just starting out in martial arts in five to 10 years. In real estate, it is very realistic if you're committed to be financially free in five years. Anybody, you start with zero. I started with zero. I was totally financially free. The problem is I didn't have anybody checking my ego, so I blew it all up. Right, right. And you had to start over. But you I did have to start over. Yeah. And, and that's, that's too much for most people. So you want, you want to avoid the whole start over the whole redo timeout box thing. Right. Make sure you have people around you that can shake you loose when you get too successful because too successful makes you feel invincible, 10 feet tall and bulletproof. And that is where you're going to blow up and have to start over. For most people, if you're thinking about that idea of being 50, 55 years old, 60 and starting over, it would tear the living crap out of you. So it would, it would, it would scare the living crap out of you. Yeah. That, that, that is not something you have to do unless you're not willing to listen to other people. And that's, that's where the ego, you really got to put that in check and, and have a bigger reason than just more. It's got to be a why that matters. Mine was just more. More doesn't, doesn't, is not sustainable, by the way. That's so true. That is so true. You know, uh, I've heard several people say, I don't know if it was Tony Robbins at first that said it, but success leaves clues, right? Always be learning from people who are successful, who are where you want to be. 
right? So what kind of tools and skills does uh, somebody need to be a great investor? You, you've got to be super conscious about the environment that you're around. And I see this all the time. Unfortunately, I see it with my family. I see it with people I've known where they don't want to change their environment and they think that their life is going to change. The, the reality is that our lives are a reflection of our environment and our belief system. And right. if we've got, I mean, I wrote about this in Reinvented Life when I talk about your Bucky Five. When Chris and I dug into that, it was really, really scary clear that we are an average of those five people that we're around all the time. And it's not just their money, it's their values, it's their health, it's their, their philosophies. And if we don't change that, if we're not willing to change that, then you know what? Just prepare yourself. You're going to have your life the same as it is now five, 10 years down the road. So being conscious about that, that is one of the big things. And then being really clear about what you really value. So people will say, I value this. And I say, no, you don't. And they say, how do you know? And I say, because I'm looking at your calendar. I see where you're spending your time and I'm looking at your money. I know what you're spending money on. Therefore, you're a liar. You're a big fat liar. Wow. Because what you're saying and what you're spending are not in alignment. Saying two different things. There, there's two different things. You want to know somebody's truth? Look at their calendar. Look at their bank statement. Wow. Man, this is good stuff. This is awesome. So what, what are uh, the top three things that uh, you learned from starting? I mean, you've started, what, 30-some businesses? Yeah, see, this is the problem with being an entrepreneur. It's fun, but you just you, you really can't stop because you get so much joy and excitement and you out get of creating. Quick and want to move to the next deal. <laughs> and, and and then part of the maturity with being an entrepreneur is being able to stick with something, and that's really hard when you're a fast starter. Right. So, but the the juice is in the commitment. It's it's like in martial arts. You can you can start twenty different martial arts, but when I went deep into aikido for almost a decade and a half, that put me in a place where I could actually birth my own martial art. You know, bir birthing Yokido was a reflection of a deep commitment over many, many, many years. So in, in being an entrepreneur and learning from all those startups, I mean, one, you want to structure, you want to build the structure up front, but you don't want to spend your whole life building the structure because you're going to change your structure as you go. So one of the things I messed up on, I didn't have my numbers clear, meaning I didn't have a bookkeeper or an accounting thing for the first two years of real estate. Right. You gotta have, your first two, first two people you should hire, a bookkeeper, which you can do for 50, 100, 200 bucks a month. Everybody should have a bookkeeper. Right. And the other one is have a freaking coach that can call you and say, hey, you're, here's your blind spot. If you don't know what your blind spots are, you're, you, you don't know what you don't know. And that is a huge problem because it's going to cause a lot of hemorrhaging and a lot of amputations. Man, that is so true. That's so true. Now, what are some of the things that you work with people on? I know you, you know, you work with people, you, you are the money mentor. What are some of the things that you work with people on? Some challenges you've seen them overcome that you've helped them with? We get to the, 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 the really the question, what is? And what people think is, is usually not what it is. Meaning, so somebody, this a guy came in and, and showed up about a year ago and he said, I have this problem. I need to make more money. And I said, you make, I think in his case, he made about 900,000 a year. He had $5 million. He was in his early forties. His problem wasn't that he wasn't making enough money. He was not able to actually spend any of his life doing the things that he loved. And so he thought if he worked harder and made more money, it's really a question of what do you deeply value? What's your second and third order consequence? Meaning what do you deeply value? Not just the surface level. You get a big commission check, feels good in the moment, but when your deep desires to create and to do other things aren't being satisfied, you let your left feeling hollow and shallow. This is where a lot of people end up with a lot of alternative activities. Like they get, they just drink all the time because they're numbing the pain of not satisfying that third level, that the consequences of what you really want. So really getting into that space of figuring that out, and the other thing that's, that's very, very different is that we get candid quick. We, we go deep into the numbers and really understand what's going on. And this is hard for most people. Most people are never going to call or want to engage because they don't want anybody to see them naked. And when you get your numbers looked at by somebody else that's willing to tell you the truth, it's like being naked in right. public. You know, so that's a huge difference. Most people like to, I think most of the coaches and mentors out there and people that are doing work, uh, unfortunately, are not willing to call people out on their stuff because they want to keep that income stream at being a coach or a mentor. My job is to f get myself fired. I want people to be strong with the truth and, and say, you know what? I'm good. And then I can say, great. Me too. I'm good when you're good. 
I don't want you to be hanging on to me for the rest of your life. I don't even want you around for a couple of years hanging on. I want you to be strong. And that's where we build the confidence through the truth. Man, that's really good. This is, this is good stuff. I really like this. I like this. So <clears throat> what would you tell a newbie? Uh, or maybe a better way to put that is, what would you tell your newbie self if you were starting over from scratch? One of the things that we that most people do, and I did this, was I had my, my expectations on what was going to happen short term were way too big, and my expectations for long term were way too small, and we just we overestimate short and we underestimate long term, and right. really being honest about it and saying, okay, I had somebody come into me and said, I want to be financially free in a year, and I said, what do we what are we working with, and she said, I've got fifty thousand bucks, and I said, what do you want to get to? She said, I want ten thousand a month, and I said, you need a therapist. You, you don't need me. You seriously need a therapist because you're out of your mind. And if she said, I want to do this and, and I have a five-year time horizon, I would have said, totally. And a lot of that 50000 would have been on training because it's not about having cash. It's about right. the right mindset and the right commitment. So I would have told myself, keep the right person around you to give you feedback and, and look out five years and have whatever your vision is, add a zero to it, 10 exit that's more likely to pull you because it's a bigger, it's a bigger mass. It's like the moon. There's like a gravitational pull to it. If it's too small, you won't notice it. And people are thinking too small. They're playing too safe. So I would have said, go fail faster, go, go dream bigger and then go get to work and stay focused. Don't get knocked all over the place. Like when somebody says, I've got four things and I have one business. If you have four businesses and your name is not Richard Branson, you're crazy because the truth is you're probably not very successful at anything. And if you say, well, no, I'm making some money here and there. Great. Are you making more than a million bucks in each one of those things? Because if you're not, cut three, do one and dig into it. That's how you're going to make the big impact. Right. That's really good. That's really good. Um, you, you, have, you have this thing that you say that your, your one mission is to free people from money bondage. Explain that. We've got this series of beliefs that we are baked into our psyche and it's what are being reinforced by, by the financial system and Wall Street. It's, it's basically that you're too stupid and it's too complicated for you to understand money. And I just fundamentally disagree with that. I, I believe that it's, it's something that anybody with a second grade education can say, okay, I'm going to take control of this. It's really, I hear this from women a lot too and it really makes me mad because I saw it with my own mom. And it's, it's this idea that we're not smart enough that somebody with a suit or somebody with a swag or the MBA, PhD, all that kind of crap right. is, is better off. Who, who's going who's gonna to love? Who's going to cherish? Who's going to respect your money more than you? And nobody. And so it's shifting people into a space of self-responsibility, ownership. Shackles are about not being a victim, not blaming and not justifying. The moment you shift into total responsibility for your money life, that's when you're free. It's, but until you do that, you're never going to be free. It doesn't matter how much money. Ask the people that had $100 million with Bernie Madoff, and then they went to zero overnight. Ask right. them how free they felt. They were never free. They felt good, but you know what? They realized how not free they were because they had no confidence, they had no skills, and they had no control. Wow. Wow. Man, this is good. This is really good stuff. You know, uh, you, you've, written, you've written quite a few books. I've got some, some of your books here. Right, yep. I love this. I love this. <clears throat> how two friends move from conflict and pain to consciousness and purpose, and how you can too. That's really good. The QRP book. I love that. I love that. Qualified retirement plan, and this is one I got to read right here. Right, uh, the guide to, to uh, gold and silver. Quick and dirty guide to gold and silver. That's good. So, da Damien, if somebody wanted to reach out to you and uh, get some more information about you and, and watch your podcast. I mean, you have the Black Belt Wealth podcast and, uh, and some other things as well. How would somebody reach out to you? Best thing you can do if you want to take action, because I, it's, it's one thing to listen and absorb and read, but if, if you really want your life to change, you got to do something. You have to have a physiological you know, body and mind emotional experience. Right. I, I would say go to reinvention.net and download the Reinvented Life Workbook. So reinvention.net, I put all of the exercises from that one book into a downloadable workbook and it'll give you something that you can do. I see people reading books and they go, I read all these books and I go, well, have you marked them up? And they say, well, no, I, I read them and I got some good ideas. And they go, but you haven't done anything. It's like my old partner that said, I'm making progress. I'm like, you're not doing crap. 
you're, you're really, you're not making progress. What's show me the actual action. And, right. and that's, that's where you can really start changing things if your pen and paper meet. And so download reinvented life's workbook by going to reinvention.net. Get that start there. I mean, you, it'll, it'll allow you to engage. I want to be able to give you something that you can do something with, not just another idea that you're never going to actually embrace and run with. That's really good. Man, that's good stuff. I really, really appreciate it. If they wanted to get your books, uh, would this be a, a good website they could go to as well? Or do you have another website? You know, you can always go to Amazon. There's, there's always Amazon to, to pick up the books. And I, I just, I want to, the, the problem we have is there are a million options. It's what Soviet, the USSR used to say, oh, America's terrible. There's too many options. Well, it's, it is kind of a problem when you have so many options, you don't know which one to start with. And, and the FOMO, the fear of missing out, prevents you from doing anything. So my suggestion is start with one thing, get that book and ask some different questions and write them down. So reinvention.net is the one thing. Don't do anything else. Literally do that one thing, grab that book and run with it. That's, that's going to start to change things and start to push you in the right direction for you. That's really good advice, man. It's very admirable. You're not trying to push a bunch of books. You're just saying, start with one thing, just go there right now and take action. So guys go to reinvention.net. We'll have it in the show notes. And, um, I really appreciate you being on, Damien. Thank you so much. This is really good. Thanks, everybody, for watching. I really appreciate it. Be sure and give us some feedback on, uh, on iTunes and, uh, and also give us a shout-out, some comments on Facebook. And thank you guys so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks again. Thanks, I appreciate it, buddy. Thank you. Thanks a lot.